Mars has long held a prominent place in science and science fiction. When we knew little about Mars, science was blurred with fiction, and incredible stories of Mars brimming with life as a red version of the Earth ran rampant. As generations of scientists worked to uncover the true Mars from fiction, they found an inhospitable and barren world, devoid of any obvious life on the surface. It was clear that as it is today, Mars is no place humans could comfortably call home. But even faced with this disappointing reality, hope for Mars wasn't fully lost. Sure, it's not a nice place for us to live today, but maybe we could reshape the environment of Mars to match our image of what a world we could call home should look like. This idea of changing an entire world to be like the Earth with a thick atmosphere, a temperate climate, lots of surface water, and life all over the place is broadly known as terraforming. This idea of reshaping worlds first made its way into the mind of humanity exactly opposite to what we're talking about here. In 1898, War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells gripped the world, where Martians in their conquest of Earth began altering the environment with plants and machines to match the conditions of Mars that Martians needed to survive. Simply put, they were Mars-forming terror. So clearly this idea of changing worlds to accommodate life has been around for a while. For me, the first time I really encountered and appreciated the concept of terraforming was in the game Red Faction Guerrilla. This game takes place on Mars where you play as a Martian freedom fighter determined to free Mars from the tyranny of Earth. Mixed in with blowing up buildings, you see the processes of terraforming taking place. By the end of the game, you see plants growing on the surface of Mars. In this case, terraforming has brought life to the red, dead planet. In recent years, we've seen the idea of terraforming Mars begin to leave science fiction and become a serious consideration for our reality. This is in large part thanks to the powerful vision pushing SpaceX forward to the goal of making humanity a multi-planetary species. For years, I was enticed and amazed at the seemingly realistic prospect that we could turn Mars into a world full of life. But as I learned more about the nature of Mars, the more I realized this was still science fiction. So in this video, I'm going to tell you why we can't terraform Mars. On face value, Mars is a great candidate for colonizing and terraforming. It's relatively easy to get to. Also, the length of a Martian day is about 24 hours and 37 minutes long, which is great if you're a fan of 24 hour clocks. And the main thing it appears to be missing is an atmosphere. Without a dense atmosphere, surface temperatures can be freezing, water can't exist as a liquid on the surface, and of course, we wouldn't be able to breathe. Initially, things don't look so great, but Mars has a lot of ice in the form of water ice, and perhaps more importantly, carbon dioxide ice sitting beneath the surface. Thinking about the ice can lead you to a pretty appealing plan, which goes as follows. Mars doesn't have a thick atmosphere, so it has low temperatures. So low, in fact, that the stuff that forms an atmosphere is frozen just beneath the surface as ice. Therefore, if we make an atmosphere that can trap enough heat, then we can sublimate the ice, and just like that, we have an atmosphere. Really speaking, it's a pretty simple plan, and pretty appealing. It might seem far-fetched that we could change an entire planet so drastically, but we prove time and time again on Earth that humanity is capable of substantially changing an atmosphere by adding greenhouse gases, even when we're not even trying. Unfortunately for us on Earth, we're very good at making greenhouse gases. In fact, too good. But imagine just how much greenhouse gas we could make if we were actually trying. I'm sure we could turn the Earth into a Venus if we really tried. So it seems reasonable that we could also heat Mars. Once you have an atmosphere, then the next problem is you need to process the atmosphere and land to make it more survivable for life. This problem again has a relatively simple solution, as long as you don't mind waiting. You can use hardy plants like moss, lichen, grasses, or maybe even algae to do the work for you. 
Even aided by technology, the step of processing the Martian biosphere would take hundreds if not thousands of years. But time isn't really a problem here, any group committed to terraforming a world knows that it's a process that will take generations to complete. We see a great representation of this in The Expanse, where the citizens of Mars for generations have been committed to the same goal of making a world like Earth without the wasteful ideals of Earth. Definitely a noble cause and something I could get behind. But unfortunately, for anyone who tries this, they can't win a war against the sun. From decades of exploration, we now know that Mars once had a thick atmosphere. In fact, the carbon dioxide ices frozen on the surface were probably part of that atmosphere. An atmosphere that's now mostly lost to space. This is where the trouble begins. Mars is simply too small. Holding on to an atmosphere means fighting the sun. For a planet, fighting the sun depends on how far away it is and how massive it is. It's a fight that started at the beginning of the solar system and will go until the bitter end. The sun, as we're all familiar with, emits light. And perhaps something that we're not so familiar with is a stream of charged particles called the solar wind. These are the things planets fight against to maintain an atmosphere. The further away a planet or moon is, the less these things matter which is one of the reasons why Saturn's largest moon, Titan, can comfortably hold on to its atmosphere, despite being so small. The other perhaps more important aspect is planet mass. The heavier a planet is, the harder it is for the sun to strip away the atmosphere. So how does the sun strip atmospheres away? Well, there are a few different mechanisms. The simplest is called thermal escape where light from the sun heats up the atmosphere so much that a particle has a velocity, or speed, greater than the escape velocity of the planet. So the particle simply just runs off and doesn't look back. In the case of Mars, this only really matters for hydrogen. The next mechanism for atmospheric escape is from atoms with charge, called ions, interacting with the sun's electric field. This field can accelerate and strip away larger atoms like oxygen. With just these first two mechanisms, we have ways to easily remove hydrogen and oxygen, two very important components for water and for us to breathe. Finally, there is sputtering. This is when ions from the solar wind knock atoms from an atmosphere out into space. Few atoms are safe in the upper atmosphere under the barrage of particles coming from the sun. These processes are general, so it applies to everything in the solar system, with increasing intensity the closer you are to the sun. But clearly there are planets closer to the sun than Mars which have atmospheres. Those planets being Venus and the Earth, of course. So why can they resist the sun while Mars apparently can't? The answer largely comes down to mass. Venus is about 80% the mass of the Earth, while Mars is only 10% the mass of the Earth. This substantially lower mass leads to lower surface gravity, meaning it's much easier for the Sun to strip away atoms from Mars than it is to strip them from Venus, despite Venus being much closer. There's also another really handy tool that the Earth has at its disposal. The Earth has a strong magnetic field produced by the spinning molten iron and nickel core. This magnetic field disrupts the Sun's solar winds, guiding ions along the magnetic field lines into the poles. Along with this being an extra protective shield from the Sun, this makes the incredible aurora. Mars today at least, doesn't have a strong magnetic field. Without mass or a strong magnetic field, Mars is truly at the mercy of the Sun. And the sun isn't too merciful. To try and understand how much stuff the sun strips away from Mars, NASA sent the Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution Orbiter, or MAVEN, to watch this 4.5 billion year old battle. After years of observation, what MAVEN found was that today, even with an extremely thin atmosphere, Mars still loses about 2 kilograms of atmosphere to space every second. Now this might not seem like much, but that's 172,000 kilograms lost per day, and about 63 million kilograms lost every year. 
This is the problem with terraforming Mars. Even if you start making a dense atmosphere, the sun won't stop. It will always keep stripping away the Martian atmosphere until it dies, taking Mars with it. So it doesn't look too good, but surely there are solutions for us to get around this problem of the sun. One obvious solution would be to give Mars a strong magnetic field. This in principle would significantly slow down the ion escape and sputtering mechanisms. But how do you make a planetary magnetic field? Would you try to dig to the center of Mars, heat its core to around 6,000 Kelvin, and then spin it up? Well, where would you get the energy to do all of that? And even how would you do it? Would that even work in the end? Who knows? Perhaps instead you try to install a network of satellites that emit strong magnetic fields. But again, where do you get the energy for this? And currently, we don't have any such technology. If making a magnetic field is too hard, then what about building a big sun shield? This could protect the planet from the sun's solar winds, and maybe you could fine tune it to block parts of the solar spectrum to slow down thermal escape. This might be an okay solution, but it's an incredible engineering challenge. The shield would need to span thousands of kilometers, and being so large, the shield would be prone to strikes from asteroids of all sizes, as well as some fun dynamical gravitational effects. Despite the monumental challenge of building and maintaining it, the sun shield is, I think, a better option than trying to jumpstart a planet's core. Okay, so there doesn't seem to be a more manageable obvious solution. So let's just make sure we always produce an extra two to three kilograms of atmosphere every second to replace what's lost. This band-aid solution might seem okay until you realize that the atmospheric escape mechanisms work particularly well on hydrogen and oxygen, the two components of water. Like on Earth, water evaporates into the atmosphere where it can be broken apart by light from the sun. The hydrogen can then run away due to thermal escape, and the oxygen can get knocked out by the other processes. So unless you continuously replace oxygen and water, you might end up running out of useful things in the atmosphere, or at least have trouble maintaining a nice atmosphere. In fact, the results from MAVEN suggest that over its history, Mars has lost enough water to space to cover the entire surface of Mars to a depth of 23 meters. Now that's quite a bit of water. This is why we can't terraform Mars. Although we might make progress for some time, the sun will never relent. It will always work to strip away the Martian atmosphere. It's disappointing because a solar system with two Earth-like planets full of life would be absolutely incredible. But Venus could still be that option. It may be that in the future there's a clear solution to this problem of making Mars habitable which is achievable, but at the moment there is no such solution. Now this isn't to say that humanity shouldn't try to colonize Mars and call another world home. I think it would probably be one of the most inspiring and exciting endeavors, along with facing up to and dealing with climate change here on Earth. But most likely those who will call Mars home will do so from habitats on the surface or deep underground. Incredibly, we might even see the first Mars colonies in the next century, but there have been some comments that concern me about the future Mars colonies. Comments like using indentured servitude for colonists to pay debts, and those suggesting an intention to disregard international laws. While these claims may be made in the best faith possible, they form a very slippery slope that could quickly lead humanity back to its darkest aspects. We may not be able to control the Martian atmosphere long term, but we can always control how we move forward into the future. When we do go to Mars, I hope it's an endeavor that highlights the best of humanity, a project that unifies the Earth in exploring and surviving the unknown. And that's really a future I hope we all get to see.